Hey, Anthony, it's Che, uh, Roleplay Rescue. Just wanted to call and thank you for your recent episode on your layers uh, theory. I actually particularly found your not quite stances stuff actually probably the more useful part of that episode. And I really thank you for that. It was really interesting to to like think about. It. You got me thinking. It helped me actually realize that the sort of in my head, there's a sort of a hierarchy that's kind of signs to come of like what's like kind of if I'm wanting this particular experience, these are the things that I need to order in. And in on down, and obviously at the top of the experience for me is um, this idea of uh, kind of it's 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 in character as character, as you put it, um, and kind of what you need to do to organise that. But I just wanted to also comment on the frames versus layers thing. For me, like your layers thing, uh, layers imply kind of uh, stratification, and I don't see how that's blurring the lines at all. Actually, to me, that's just like layer cake, you know, like. There's a spongy bit, and then there's that spongy bit, and another spongy bit, or you know, sediment or something. Uh, that tends to indicate to me, like semantically at least, sort of basically in intransigence. So it's ironic. Um, yes. Dear listeners, you are indeed listening to the Casting Shadows podcast. Now, of course, you have been listening to Che Webster opening the show, and I thought I would interject this welcome at that very opportune moment in his SpeakPipe message to let you know you're in the right place. And to let you in on some context. First of all, this is not a reflection from the road, although I will be, from time to time, inserting some things which were recorded in the car, and my apologies for that. But the bulk of this show was recorded under normal circumstances. So, the context is this. A few weeks ago now, I had a conversation with Che, and we recorded it. I followed that up with recording the episode that you've already heard, the one before this, which is about layers of play. I did that to help Jay and I and anyone else who's interested further our conversations with greater context and understanding of what it is that we're talking about uh, and that sort of thing. They've, of course, Jay has already done that on his show, and so I'm following suit. Therefore, the conversation that you're about to hear came first. The phone call that you're in the middle of hearing, or the speak speak pipe call that you're in the middle of hearing, came last. So, (laughs) the second item you heard first. The last item you heard second. The first item you are about to hear. But first, we'll let Che finish his call And this will be the perfect segue from the previous episode into the episode that sparked it. All right. Back to Che. For me, the frame stuff is really useful. Where do you think of a frame? You seem to be talking about a frame being something that's sort of static, as in like the picture frame. I think more of the window frame, and I imagine there being sort of three windows that you could look out of. Um, and for me, this is this matches with cognitive psychology because basically, whatever we direct our attention to, that is what we experience. And obviously, we can switch our attention to, from one thing to another thing, and we can even do it very, very quickly. Um, and you know, we have this sort of sense of it can become so practiced, as you pointed out, that actually we don't even seem to really notice it. But actually, cognitively and what's happening with our brain, it's been pretty substantively proven that it actually lowers our overall cognitive ability if we're switching a lot. Um, and so to me, like, uh, why would I want st- like, to stare out the window which has my character in the world? And in fact, I want to stare out the window as my character looking out on that world. And I don't want to spend too much time looking through the rules window or even the us around the table window. Um, and I certainly don't want to be bobbing between them at high speed. So that was kind of where I come from with it, really. Um, I also think, like, frame, obviously, is, is, is drawing on sort of Einsteinian thought as well, isn't it, around relativity and things like that. But um, I don't know. 
semantics are interesting. I just want to say a massive thank you for the episode and well, I hope you will. Uh, catch you soon. Che, thank you so much for that message, or that two-part message. I really appreciate it. And also the two conversations that we've now had, which preceded it. And I'm looking forward to more. I'm not going to add too much to the fairly extensive runtime of this episode by answering each of your amazing points now, but I can't let that message go by and not comment on the awesomeness of the frame as in window frame, as in standing, let's say, in the corner of your house and being able, from a relatively stable position, to look out different windows at different views. This had never occurred to me in response to the term frame, and it gives me lots of enthusiasm and excitement and motivation for going back and diving back into the semantics that I love so well. Not with any real hope that I will find the perfect word for all people everywhere, but I might be able to improve how I talk about things, and that, to me, has tremendous value, because it also impacts and changes how I'm able to think about things. And that leads to change. Change is good. And so, let's change direction now. I will do another episode specifically focused on feedback that I have gotten from this and conversations that have been scattered around in the podcasting realm. Uh, great comments from Free Thrall at Keep Off the Borderlands, as well as from Jason Hobbs at Random Screed, and from Jason Connerly from Nerds RPG Variety Cast, and hopefully more as the episodes spread out and people have time to listen. But anyway, with no further ado, let's get to the conversation, because that is key. This conversation is not a debate. It's not an argument or conflict. It's not one person trying to show that they are right and educate the other. This, as you'll hear us say in the conversation itself, is an exploration. It's an opportunity to share experiences, and in the sharing, maybe, hopefully, and I can say now, from the future, (laughs) definitely learn something. Anyway, let's go. You may be surprised, but today on the Casting Shadows podcast, we have a guest from far, far away. Of course, all of my guests, were there to be any, would always be far, far away because I live here on the other side of the world in the future. But all of that aside, today we're going to be talking with Che Webster, the host of Roleplay Rescue. And rather than me telling you about him, let's ask him to tell you about himself. Che? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, okay. So I'm British. Uh, and um, in 2018, I was an angry British GM with no players. Because um, all my players had, had left. I nearly swore then. Um, and <laughs> so in, in November, well, actually, in uh, what we're we talking about, well, October 2018, I got interviewed by a lovely chap um, whose name entirely eludes me because it's like five years ago. Um, but he did this podcast called Mega Dungeon and it did like four episodes and interviewing me was the last episode that apparently killed the podcast. Um, but in being interviewed, I realized that I had something to say. Um, and, and that interview was about like, you know, like I'd rediscovered Mega Dungeons. Um, but I realized just I had lots to say. And then so it started pouring out of me. And what poured out of me was this. Why are people stopping playing? And get your ass back to sorry, get your bums back to the table. Right. Um, and that's where Roleplay Rescue started. It became this kind of like frustrated yelling into the void about like, why are all the people uh, leaving my table? It never occurred to me back then. It was because of me. Um, 
they would blame it on life, you know? You know, oh, yeah, well, I've got kids now. Um, or, you know, our career is difficult. Or the wife won't let me out. You know, things like that. Right. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're in, into my 50s. So back then I was like late 40s um, and couldn't work out why, you know, basically everybody around me was giving up, seemed like giving up the hobby. Um yeah. And so, yeah, so Rob Levesque was this kind of frustrated yelling into the void about like, um, shouldn't like guys, seriously, you know, can't you prioritize some time for fun for yourself? And can't you like, you know, get permission for like a couple of hours, maybe like once for now and then just to have a laugh. Yeah. Um, and it turns out I wasn't the only one in the universe who's a bit frustrated about that. Um, and so Rob Levesque, I mean, five years later now, we, we're nearly there or four and a three quarter years or something at the time of recording this so um it turns out that there are a lot of people who want to get back to the table but they're really afraid about that and they don't know how um and there's loads of anxiety around it and um mm. yeah so i've just been wittering for about five years about all of that and um and along the way i discovered why it was all my players left and that's because of basically an unreliable gm uh i describe myself as the world's flakiest gm so hi um <laughs> And I still am. And, and, but, you know, the thing is that I'm constantly wanting to sort of present uh, to my players a really great gaming experience. And then when I play, there's a sort of very specific experience I'm after when I play that no one provides. So I GM instead, really. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm a pain in the butt, aren't I, really? Um, but I'm not as angry as I was and uh, a lot calmer about it all, I think. So that's that me. implies the the void was shouting back. <laughs> me too. Well, you, me know, too. you know, so you know what they say about uh, staring into the void, right? <clears throat> <laughs> well, it's that you have hit on on it exactly at the nail on the head. There's a particular experience that you are looking for, mm-hmm. and uh, one thing that I realized about my own game mastering is that the experience that I would like to provide for the players. I am denying to myself hmm. when running the game. I, I will most of the time not be able to have that experience if I'm game mastering. And mm-hmm. recently on your episodes, you've been talking about tangentially or directly things which are the cause or cause or the reason for this, things like the impact of system on play or whether or not we will stop to talk about rules or, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I thought, Hey, let's reach out across the globe and talk about it. (laughs) Okay. That's kind of amazing to me as well. And we are living in the science fiction. Like when I was in the eighties, you know, we, we, we used to, I honestly remember having this conversation at school in the eighties about, wow, do you think it'll ever be like Star Trek where you're like on screen and like t- <laughs> live video? We're doing it. Yeah, we're doing except it. You're not, exactly. Except you're not on a spaceship, which is slightly exciting, but Well, I'll 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 try to do better for the next one. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um would it so would it help if I outlined the experience I am looking for at the table? Yeah, I think that'd be awesome. Um, Because I think I've figured it out. Um, It's kind of simple, really. I I want... um, So what I'm looking for in my role-playing games, if I'm a player, right? Right. I I, I don't get this experience, right? There is no GM who is in the right time zone for me and will provide this experience for me um, because they all think I'm mad. (laughs) Right? So, um, So what I'm looking for is a game where I can... um, I'm I'm an explorer first and foremost, so I want to explore your game world. So first of all, I want there to be a game world to explore. That's interesting, mm-hmm. um, and and to be honest with you, almost anything's interesting to me if I haven't been there before. So that's that's easy. Um, and then what I would like to do is I want to inhabit a character. I want to inhabit a role of mm-hmm. character, and I don't want um, a shallow, randomly rolled up thing that's like a shell. I want to imagine a character who's like a real believable person within that world. Um, and that doesn't mean to say like they're entirely dull, you know, 
Um, but it does. <laughs> but it does mean that they are a human, and I'm and I'm really the subgenre of gaming that I tend to aim for. So if I'm in science fiction, it would be sort of harder more grounded science fiction if it was a fantasy game it would be a more grounded lower fantasy lower magic much more sort of human scaled not super heroic okay right. and then and then when i'm in role what i want to do is imagine myself as a character and make decisions as a character which is what i consider the role playing to be right. and i don't want to come out of character i want to stay in character frame to use um the sort of three fame theory and um and i don't really want to faff about by be with anything other than being in character in the world and basically it's the make believe bit that i want to enjoy yeah mm. right cool so that, that's and i think like that sounds really simple doesn't it sound like how it was pitched to you originally yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely so me too and how it's so. yeah pretty much how it was pitched to me originally uh, i started playing traveler when i was with some friends and it was like yeah you get to be this character in a sort of science fiction worldy thing and you're gonna have a spaceship and fly about and that's what we did we mucked about flying around spaceships and yeah you know getting blown up and stuff and then I got into I I got RuneQuest. I stole RuneQuest off my dad because um, <laughs> my dad didn't like. He got curious. He he bought the game and then chucked it on the heap. So I stole it. And I really really strongly remember the front of BRP uh, sec, RuneQuest Second Edition as BRP basic role playing. And there's a bit at the start. I'm uh, paraphrasing, but it's like role playing is as close to like real life as you can get. It's about yeah. imagining yourself as a character in a fantasy world and then living the life of that character. That was right. what was sold to me. Um, and yeah, that's what I want, you know. But actually right. what I've got over the years is a sort of mostly um, it's sort of been a game which is at least 50-50, a bit of make-believe and like a lot of war gaming, skirmish <laughs> gaming. Um yeah. And and then sometimes it's as much as like eighty percent it's skirmish wargaming. And I, by the way, I have nothing wrong with skirmish wargaming. I love skirmish wargaming. Right. I just um when I skirmish wargame, you know, it's tactical back mat and all that. I love it. Or miniatures on a board or a table or whatever, you know, with a tape tape measure and everything. Love all of that. But that's not role playing. You know, for me, right. well so I can imagine right. myself in a character, but the difference there is if I'm I'm looking down on my character, and my character is a pawn I'm moving around, um, and and you know uh, what I want to be is in my character. So I want the perception of my character. I want to imagine I'm looking through my character's eyes. Describe to me the scene that my character can see mm. through my senses. That's what I want. Right, which is I think an important hook here for this particular discussion is that you know we can enjoy tactical role play like for me the combining the role play aspects of the mech warrior universe mm -hmm. with the tactical aspects of the battletech game has been mm -hmm. a, a pretty important part of play mm -hmm. and being able to switch from playing your character and then playing the skirmish game or uh you know a higher level game than mm. that you know it's a, it's a big deal and it's a, a useful skill but it's not the same game and yeah. if if i say to you that we're going to come over and play mech warrior but we end up playing battletech you know somebody at the table might feel i think justified in being upset they they came to role play mm. but instead we we did something else but yeah, I mean, um, I've, I mean, I have BattleTech on the shelf over there. You know, I've re the recent um, starter sets and stuff. You know, I played that back in the day, enjoyed it. I've rediscovered it. I love it as a tabletop war game. Absolutely fab. Yeah. But you're right. If you say so, I run a, a, a gaming club at this school, and and we sort we started as a role playing club, and then it sort of took on the game, other gamers, the war gamers, the board gamers, and the chess players, all and the card gamers. They're all part of the group now. Um, and it's really it's really weird to sort of see 
um that those kind of things happen someone says hey yeah we're going to play you know come over we will do some role playing and then before they know it they're actually playing a tactical skirmish war game <laughs> and, and they're having a good time but there are some players in the table going well, uh, this isn't the role playing game this um, isn't the role playing game yeah, yeah and, and so and, and, and some of that, I think, is just simply not communicating about what we want. Sure. You know. And we end up on a, on a procedural level talking to each other completely differently. Like, I can't describe the scene through your character's eyes if we have to talk about the essential elements of the war game aspect. Movement rates, turns, initiative orders, and, yeah. and things like that. Um, we end up creating a different experience how we talk to each other yeah and and to be fair like that there's what i call the regular kind of role-playing game um there's a lot of switching between uh the three frames I, i'll just go through the three frame theory really quickly uh it sure. comes from gary allen fine 1983 or four something like that uh shared fantasies the book um but basically he posits this idea that uh, we have three frames. So there's a sort of rules frame where we are talking game mechanisms, rolling dice, numbers, rules, referencing, all that kind of stuff. Um, right. And and that's one particular frame. Then we've got a player frame. So that's me sitting here talking to you. If we were playing a game right now, uh, I would be aware that I'm sitting in this room looking at the screen of the camera. Um, right. And I can't really ever fully escape that, but there are things that will happen in the session that will throw me right back to oh, I'm a player sitting at the table. So, for example, someone cracks a funny, a, a cracks a funny that's not to do with the game. Is yeah. you know, the classic I drop a Star Wars pun or something, right? <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> now we're laughing, we're having a good time. There's nothing wrong with that, but we're back being players again. So yes. the We've broken back into that that being humans sitting around a table imagining things, which is fine. The third frame is a character frame, is what Fine calls it. I tend to think of it as also including the world itself. Um, and it's right. what Daniel Jones um calls other world immersion. So the 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 point where I'm in the world and the character and I am now immersed within that experience. And the degree to which I can maintain that for a long period of time is important to me. And mm -hmm. in a regular kind of game, what happens is I'm sort of in character and I make, so you ask me what I want to do and I, I tell you what I want to do and how I want to do it. And then you start to interact with me. And then there comes a point where you go, oh yeah, well, roll, you know, roll some dice, you know, roll that skill. Da, da, da. And now I'm in rules frame and, yeah. and I'm no longer immersed in my character. Um, and and that's okay, but there's a sort of what psychologists call a switching cost because as we move yeah. from one task to another task, we it takes us mental energy to do that, and then moving back costs us mental energy. So it's actually quite taxing and tiring to do this switching, which everyone thinks in the regular kind of game is kind of like completely normal. Um, but it's actually why I become so exhausted when I play in that way as well. Uh, I discovered yeah. that when I am in one frame – I'm I'm able to sustain longer periods of play um, and it's more enjoyable. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I wanted to be clear about that, that whole sort of switching between those frames. And, of course, we do it all the time and to some degree you can't avoid it because, you know, I'm a human being playing a game <laughs> and imagining being a character. And those, I mean, fine theory is you can't have a, a role-playing game without all three of those going on. What I question is the degree to which all three of those have to go on yeah, you know, it doesn't have to be an equal share of all those three. You know, it can right. be that you can preference one or the other. So I know some players who would prefer the rules frame most of the time, and they're really yeah. quite detached from the character. And the time when they are in character frame is when they're making a decision, and they might often. I mean, it's, and by the way, being in character frame doesn't mean to say you're acting or anything. So you know, they can right. describe what they want to do in third person or whatever. But there will be this kind of quick back to the action of. Of the table so there my experience there and it's not to prejudice any particular game but with uh sort of fifth edition and fourth edition and third edition dungeons and dragons games where there's been use of battle mats and tokens and things like that and there's a lot of combat focused gaming and dungeoneering gaming that that, that a lot of players lo who like that kind of game will love mm. the rulesiness of it and the, knowing every spell and knowing what the damage of every weapon is and every feat and ability you know that like really exactly. players who seriously immerse themselves in rules and that's great that just bores me right because we end up we end up with preferences 
Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, games like that, they offer people something to engage with on that, on that level. And mm. whereas there are some games that simply imply that you can do that. Like you can also play this game with a battle mat and figures and that. Yeah. And that's it. So anything else you'd have to, you'd have to invent. Um, yeah, it gets, it gets difficult in gaming conversation to separate preference from mm. procedure and to step away from value judgments and, you know, it's like, oh, you like to play that way? Well, yeah, you're wrong, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and I think, and this is another thing that Daniel Jones uh, is a very good um, friend of mine now. He, when he first introduced me to this approach to playing, this is about three or so years ago now, but he he talked about, he talks about methodology. Uh, he talks about the sort of three pillars of things being sort of your, he calls a mechanisms, methodology, and, and then sort of world. Um, and the mechanisms are obviously rules of mechanisms and, and how you adjudicate and do things. And he's, he said, you've got to have a, his view is you've got to have a really strong sense of that. And it's really important to have a, a you know, a, a good grounded set of rules at detail. He's not a rules light fan, nor am I, <laughs> um, you know, so it sounds odd perhaps to, you know, if I'm saying I'm not really wanting to be focused on the rules, but I do want them to be relatively detailed and reliable and grounded. Right. So no, um, I'm not, a, I don't like rules light. So because uh, it, it feels too wishy-washy you know, and we can talk about why that is perhaps but what i don't want to be doing is spending my entire time talking about them and and interacting with those directly um yeah. and, and it, this comes back to daniel's point which is methodology is first and i think a lot of people don't don't think about this you know the, the way we play the game uh we often play the game the way we were taught to play the game and then we assume that that's the way everybody plays the game and right. what I've really started to uncover is that there are lots and lots of different ways, different methods. And it comes back to the, if you ask yourself, what experience do I want? What am I aiming for? Then you can kind of line up behind that, all the things that will get you to that experience. And it right. might be that, you know, there are some things that you assumed were like absolutely essential to you, to the game and how the game is played that you suddenly decide, decide if I want this particular experience that maybe i don't need to do that thing or in fact maybe even worse that thing gets in the way of that experience that i want to have exactly and that's i think that's a tough realization you know that's a, that's a, a fair bit of introspection <laughs> especially when <laughs> carry carrying the game forward into every new game you know you haven't actually yeah. played the new game you've just been kind of changing the one small stratum you know, like the the rules of it but you're still doing everything else your culture of play hasn't hasn't changed regardless of of context mm. and uh and then when it, preference yeah, so, gets in the way you know yeah so for me i for years i thought the problem was the rules that if i found just the it's only i can find the <laughs> rule sets then <laughs> i will have the experience that i'm looking for and of course daniel helped me see that that the rules they're important but yeah. they aren't going to give you the ex rules themselves I, I think it's actually s john ross who who said that like rules are i think i got that right um rules are like dead you know they're, they're, they're not human things right rule mechanisms are like these cold hard systems procedures and everything else mm. but they, they they don't give you anything they're tools to be used right but they don't they can't give you any particular experience. You can't interact with rules and, and the rules will get excited. You know, like you could be excited <laughs> about the rules. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, the yeah. rules aren't going to be excited back. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, whereas like if I'm focused on the people at my table and the interaction we're having, they're human beings. And so they, I, if I am like acting in a particular way, they're going to respond to me in their human kind the, the rules are always the same right they don't, they don't change but um in a sense, but the yeah. human beings you know the experience that we're sharing together that's the thing that i think is really rich and mm. and that's where the creativity and the inventiveness comes and of course i'm exploring because i said i want to explore your world and i want to explore my character but the reality is i also want to explore the people at the table um which yeah. is a, that's a deep that's a deep thing but there we go the, you know there's this sort of interaction that i want to explore too yeah and uh, and we talked the last time we talked when we were on on your show we talked about how what 
what people choose as their character and the way they they represent their character in the game world tells us a significant amount about them and mm. uh, so there's multiple things that we get to learn mm -hmm. um in regard to rules i know i have my favorites but i think the the one realization i've i've made about rules and how they affect my play is is like in advertising it's the it's the white space that sells you know what is it I don't, and i don't mean about a light rule i just mean that where is there no friction for what i'm what i'm trying to do and yeah. uh i like to play games with an atmosphere i, I like to play horror games mm. but i find that an awful lot of horror rule sets will encourage the game master in one part of the rule book to build atmosphere and be descriptive and you know pay attention to the players and how they're feeling and try and help them scare themselves and i think all that's fantastic but at the same time at that point of tension will then introduce a whole series of of interactions entirely on the rules layer or in the you know the yeah. the rules frame to yeah. to borrow similar language and so all that atmosphere is now gone unless the play group is so familiar with that process that they no longer notice the switching right they've yeah. heard themselves to it somehow <laughs> yeah i guess there's sort of two layers because that so one option is everyone gets so familiar that we don't have to do a lot of thinking about it so you know we've kind of we've made it automatically we've got habits of how to re adjudicate the rules so like i know that i've got to roll the dice and i can glance at them and see the numbers and i kind of know my what my numbers are and all of that's going on cognitively and you switched into that mode but it happens quite quickly because the brain's an amazing thing and it's sort sure. of if you're an autopilot you can do that if you're really familiar so if everyone's got mastery of the rule set then that's really great um what i find is that most players i, I you know i know don't master the rules because they're constantly playing different games so they never really right. master the rules of any game so um yeah. so if i played to take one example if i was to play call of cthulhu and do a horror game with you if we played long enough then um you know all like you build the atmosphere and there might be this point where i can kind of switch and do that die roll in and then it wouldn't be and too retain. much of an impact yeah yeah and i and i might be able to get quite quickly back but there's still been a cost and there's still been the straining so here's a simple question yeah. like why don't the gm just handle the numbers and i can remain in the frame as my character scared witless why yeah. why do i have to roll the dice actually why why not just have the gm roll them and you can do that behind the screen in front of, i don't care in fact i'd rather it was behind the screen so i can't see them and be distracted by it so i can still remain terrified i can hear the <laughs> clatter and know that rules are being adjudicated yeah, yeah. but fundamentally if i trust my gm um and i know like if i'm logical about this i know that it doesn't make any difference if i pick up the dice and roll them or if they do um right because if the right dice aren't weighted then it doesn't matter who rolls them, right? It's no. just this with this superstition we have that if I roll the dice, then I might do better. Um, like as if, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's psychic influence over the dice, and you know, I'm curious Maybe. about these things. And you know, um, <laughs> and 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 if so, then that changes things. But I, I've yet to see conclusive evidence of that. So in the, I, in the absence go, of that, <laughs> yeah. But even so, even if I could change the dice with my mind and bend my will, which never seems to happen because they always like fluff on me. Uh, you know, it's like <laughs> the dice betray me constantly. Um, even if that was true, I'd still think I would prefer that someone else rolled them so I could just stay terrified in the moment, scaring myself. Yeah. And I think, I think that's really valuable. Um, I, I think it's in a, in a sense, evidence of the preference the, the real and demonstrable preference that you mm. can play in what I call in character mm. as character going for the experience as you describe yeah. it right? mm -hmm. where there are no other intentions you're not there to interact with the rules for fun mm. you can but that's not what you're looking mm. for right now and you're not there for the socializing 
player to player. That's pre-game. That's post-game. Yeah. Not during the game, right? What you're looking for is that in-character experience. Whereas someone with a different set of preferences may not even be able to recognize this as a possibility. Yeah. Because as you say, I'm always going to be sitting in the chair. I'm always going to be looking at, you know, the, the discord screen or the, the zoom screen or whatever. And so it's always me. And so therefore the, the character experience doesn't exist. But it does. But it does. <laughs> no, because, and, and I think this is something, I think it's something I want to comment on here about how the human mind works because, uh, and this is a recent realization for me as well, but you know, people aren't very good at thinking generally okay i'm not very good at thinking because thinking is hard because what thinking yeah. has to do thinking you have to have a sort of internal dialogue and and what you have to do is you have to kind of so bear with me here but you have to kind of create sure. an internal avatar which is holding one particular idea in the mind so i'm imagining a possible future say i'm making a decision i'm thinking through a decision and i'm going to imagine one possible future and i kind of have to create this little avatar in my mind a sort of version of me that is it says mm, what would happen if i did that and imagines one set of scenario. Maybe it's the positive side of that. And I kind of like imagine that would happen. And I see some of the downsides along the way. And in my mind, I can picture that. And then right. if I'm really going to think that through, I have to create this opposite avatar that sort of, sort of says, yeah, but what if you did, didn't did do that? Or if you did something else? And then you work through this kind of process. And of course, actually, there's really probably a third avatar, which is you here in as yourself, actually kind of listening to this dialogue that you're having in right. your mind, right? So that's why I think most people think best when they're talking, which is like what we're doing now. So actually yeah. working out things together, talking it out means I don't have to create all that in my head. I've got you and I can react. I can react to what I see and I can react to what I hear and what you say. Um, and you can sort of give me feedback on what I'm saying, my ideas. And I try them out and then I can adjust them and I can, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So I think dialogue is really great for for thinking things through. But of course, that same ability to create this imagined self in the imagined future, well, that's exactly really what we're doing when we create a character in a fantastic yeah. world. We're just imagining it's not really me. It sort of contains me. You know, I'm in there, nested in there, because I can't not be me. But right. actually, I'm clothing myself in this new role. Uh, I shall be a dastardly rogue. You know, in a, in a, oh, and then it's going to be this fantasy city, fantastic. You know, or I'm going to be the dashing captain on board a starship. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and I imagine and I picture that thing. And there's a lot of fun to be had in then, like, just exploring what that would be like, you know. And then yeah. if you've got other people at the table, it gets great because now, like, just as when we're talking about having a conversation and working out a problem together is great fun or easier. It's kind of like really interesting when you've got two or three or whatever other people at the table who are like interacting with what you're going on, reacting to what you've yes. got going on. And then you've got this GM who's throwing random stuff in, you know, and challenging yeah. you and is, is actually taking on the role of like people who oppose you and your character. Yeah. And that's that's what the fun of it all is, right? To me, it's like, why would I want to give any of a moment of that up, really? <laughs> you know, yeah. to like look up something on my character sheet and figure out why you know am i i want to shoot with my laser pistol all right okay what range am i at and what's the modifier to hit that and uh, can someone just do that for me because i want to just i'm shooting with my laser pistol you know and tell me what happens you can be in that moment yeah yeah and 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 i don't know um so i've been told all sorts of things i've been told that's really selfish I've been told that's improvised drama and not really gaming. I've been told that um, it's kind of would never work. Um, it does, by the way. Um, uh, you know, sure, all sorts of stuff that people will throw back and say, well, that's not really gaming, though, is it? That's not really, is that role playing? It's like, <laughs> well, if being in role and playing the part of your character in role is what role playing is, I put it to you that that is role playing. You know, and I, I'd go as far as say is that in the moment when I actually switch to the rules, I stop role playing and I start rules playing. playing. Rules playing, yeah, and it's just fine. Yeah. And by the way, uh, I love—I mean, I love rules immersion, which is why I like wargaming. 
Yes. Because I get to immerse myself in the tactical details and the specifics. You got what's shooting a war game table. I love that. What's the range of my laser pistol thing going on? Yes. I'm into that. And it's um, just as gripping. It's just as engaging, yeah, or yeah. to use the word immersive, mm. yeah. as, what, but I, as what we've been talking about as an in-character experience. Yeah, I just don't like custard on my roast chicken. <laughs> yes yes i don't want them touching yeah. <laughs> um no i you know like i like chicken and i like custard um but i don't necessarily want custard on my roast chicken which it's i know sounds absurd kids. but um yeah. you know like i don't want to do wargaming and role playing because I, I actually think that neither of them are good like good wargaming really needs a, a detachment from the you know a general needs to be detached from the soldiers right if I'm worried about my soldiers being human beings and stuff, I'll never send them into battle. I need to be cold, calculating, you know, um, yeah. and that's war, the war gamer. And then if I'm going to role play, then I actually, I want to, I want to love that character. Actually. I want to be that person and, and care about them and, and know what, and figure out what it is they're thinking and feeling. And I don't think mixing those two things, I think it, it lowers the, the form in both ways. So the regular kind of game for me is this sort of, yeah, it's it's custard on chicken. It's it's like it, it's it's no it, it can nourish you, but I'm not sure that it's the ideal combination. Yeah. And so what I've been trying to do is to try to imagine it the other way around, mm -hmm. where my preferred way to play this in character, not performance, not the improvised drama, yep. that mm -hmm. is also a possibility for play. Don't get oh, me yeah. wrong, but it's not what I'm talking about. It's what people hear me say when I'm not, although that's not what I'm saying, Yeah. but going for the experience, I'm trying to imagine how playing that way in character as my character through my character's eyes would feel like something was missing. Mm. That has to be imagination for me because when I play that way, I'm satisfied. And if I play in another way, then there's some a feeling of distraction or a feeling of effort or a feeling of interruption. There's some impact on my satisfaction because I'm not yeah. in my default mode. Yeah, it's a switching cost. That's what's yeah. upsetting, right? Yeah. Splashes of a custard on your chicken. Um, <laughs> but it's, it, it is. It's the switching cost. It's that jar, what's jarring is that you're cognitively switching to do something else. And um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think if you're trying to like, like multitasking is a complete myth. But I think if you're trying to do two things, what you're not doing two things at the same time, you're switching between them. You're doing Back that for a bit. You're doing that for a bit. Yeah. And actually, I, I think the basic numbers are something like if you're doing two things, then you do them both at about 40% of your brain's efficiency. So you're losing 20% of your cognitive ability, you know, when you, you make that switch. And then the more things you try and bring in, the more. So if we've got a role playing game with three things we switch between, right. that could be pretty devastating, actually, to our ability. You know, we might be getting like 20 or 30 or, you know, 20 or 30% of any of those three experiences because we're switching between them. Yeah. And so it's like, and well, you which add one's in, yeah. You add in Zoom. Yeah, which you've got on the handle, and that's so distracting. And and then if there's a dice roller and you're using Fangdry or something, you know that's a whole nother world of pain. Cause, I mean, because that's yeah. that's rules frame and player frame kind of getting jarred between each other. Because player frame is I'm fiddling around with this VTT and trying to find where I'm on my sheet and press the right yeah. button, and then then I have to as I look at what button have I got to press, which skill am I using? I then got to go to rules frame to figure out which one to choose and then back to player frame to click it and then watch the dice roll, which is rules frame. And then we can describe what happened. I'm back in character. I'm exhausted. Right. So this is, this is the kind of stuff. This is the kind of discussion that makes me wonder, right? It makes me theorize about stuff I can barely remember. Like when, when we first started to play, right? Hmm. I know kind of in a factual sense from having the documentation of the day. I didn't have Dragon Magazine. I wasn't talking to designers in those days and, and things like that. But in the material that I had, nobody talked about being a part of a story. No one talked about collaborating for this or that. Okay. They, they were talking about the character experience. Yep. The person who introduced me to gaming and the other people that I met for gaming, they're all talking about you can 
be the character or you can experience the character you can make decisions something along those lines is what they were talking about but we're all kids playing with some version of basic or some parts of advanced D, &D. Mm -hmm. and as so many people you know in their late 40s 50s talk about it we can't really be accused of having used those rule sets well <laughs> like we had yeah. fun with them but yeah. <laughs> which is different but you know we we ended up my my groups ended up having to talk about the rules a lot we internalized the basics but someone is using Menser and someone else is using Moldvay and someone else is using Holmes and someone else has a D and D and everybody thinks it's all kind it's all D and D so it's all got to be the same and compatible somehow. So there's a lot of rules talk there's a lot of in character play because that's what we think the game is so i'm kind of imagining a lot of state switching in between these various layers or frames or however we want to call them as kids. Yeah, I I remember like the earlier games. I remember we did a lot of rules talk out, out of game. So we because we had more time as well yeah. together. So you know, I, I'd go around my mate's house at like school would finish at like three thirty. We'd go around his house. It's just five minutes walk from the school, and we'd be there till six. You know, it was like tea time was six. You know, and get kicked out. So <laughs> go home. So, like, two and a half hour session every day, yeah. five days a week. And then a weekend right. session, right? Okay, so loads of time. So, you know, when we were learning, like we started with Traveller, so there's not a lot of rules there, but, you know, we'd roll up the character using the rules and that bit was rulesy and that's fine. You know, we'd roll up the character and then and then it was uh, it was kind of like imagining, you kind of imagine your way into, and then you would get, we could play. The thing is we, did, we didn't think about the rulesy bit as play. So we wanted to play the character. So that was the play bit. Yeah. Weirdly, you know, the whole character like character generation in Traveller is a whole sub game. Um, yeah. but when I look at it now, but actually, you know, we would do that bit and then that was all just to get to the game, right? I and mean, we get to the game. So we play, and then from that point, you know, occasionally um RGM would you know, you'd roll two D six, you know, it'd like you know, either slap the dice in front of you and it wasn't like roll them. It was you'd slap them in front of you. You knew you'd pick them up and roll them. And you didn't necessarily really know what the numbers meant. And he would hum and haw and behind his little board <laughs> cardboard thing and, and then and tell you what happened. And and actually, as a player, I remember not really care. I didn't really know the rules of Traveller. We played 1977 Traveller. I didn't really know the rules of Traveller. I knew that like it, higher was good on 2D6. And I know that back, low was bad. And and. And because actually, if you read the rules now, if if he was following them at all, it, there was no sort of central core mechanism anyway. So, you know, like, I don't know. I My suspicion is, I haven't really spoken to him since, but uh, we left it, each other and went our own ways in 89. I haven't seen these guys since. But my suspicion is he was pretty much making it up a lot as he went along. And it was probably the <laughs> eight plus kind of thing from the combat rules that was being used as a sort of benchmark with modifiers. Right. Um but actually, we didn't talk about rules at the table until after the game, you know. And if something, if something kind of like didn't work out, where you sort of thought, well, I didn't seem particularly fair, it sort of got parked until after the game. And then again, you, you know that bit where I fired my laser carbine and I completely missed. Yeah, how did I miss? You know. And then we would talk, <laughs> and then then maybe he'd talk through that. And then there was this conversation where it became patently obvious that, um, you know, he was making it up. But that was all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but the rules bit came. You know, the rules bit. You know, this is a great tip: is discuss rules separately. Um, and right. we hear this, we hear this in the common parlance a lot of time. You know, well, don't look up stuff at the table; like, save it for after the game. And I, I would, I would just really think there's a lot of there's a lot of value in just keep the rules bit out of the way as much as you possibly can, um, and you sort of wing it, which is easier said than done, especially if you're an anxious person like me. Um, right. But you know, like just but do possible. whatever seems yeah well, see yeah. you know daniel jones's comment is like use just use your sort of sense of gut you know like your gut feel what feels about right and then and just make an adjudication and you could do that with dice so you could just do that like i mean if, you, if someone's falling off a 20 story uh, 20 story building you know like 
you don't need a lot of mechanic <laughs> mechanical stuff to know that the guy's probably dead right so yes. um <laughs> you know i yeah you're dead um news of the weird not the yeah, you know that you know but i could get all fussy about it and look up how many d6 of damage that i roll um but do i need to do that probably not um right Unless but of course there are some revel in the yeah. system layer yeah well of course i know there will be some player listening to this and going that matters you know like it's yeah. 20d6 roll the 20d6 you might roll like all ones you know like yeah okay and he's got 21 hit points it'll be all right um <laughs> but anyway to to your point is like as a younger kid i think like when we were first playing and you know, i started when i was about seven eight mm-hmm. um and then we got into a role master in about 80, i don't know 84 85 something like that um and i remember then the gm who was running that game cared a lot more about the rules and there were a lot more rules because role master is kind <laughs> of crunchy um but even so, you know, actually at the table, it would be we'd have the we'd have the tables in front of us. So yeah, there's a lot more into rules, you know, into rules frame because I've got to look up. I'm rolling, hit my sword, I'm on my D hundred, and I add my bonus, and I look up on this chart to find out how many hits I do and what crit I do. And then I roll on right. a crit. That's all rules frame. So that 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 started to creep in. That crept in with certain games, um, but. You know, after a bit of play, because it came back to the point about mastery, you know, we played that game yes. from for at least four years. Part I think it's more like five years solid until we broke up as a group in eighty nine. Um, so we got pretty slick with right. you know, especially if I'm playing the same character for two years. I lost right. one character. I had two characters in a four year, five year campaign. So I, I got I you know, I knew what Goriel Swiftfoot who's my halfling thief. I, he had a short bow and a, and a short sword and, and a dagger, and he had those items. Apart from they became magical eventually, he had those items for two years of play. I got to know. I didn't even really need to look on the chart. Eventually, getting right. certain armor types, even those twenty armor, you know, certain armor types. I, you know, I just know vaguely that oh yeah, it'll be sort of like I don't know, about thirteen hits and an a crit or something. You should just get that familiar. Um, yes. So, but I. You know, but what happened over that time is that I got less and less and less of this time in role, and um, so that's, I got that's fidget- what I find I got, interesting. And I got fidgety at the table, and I got, and I started mm-hmm. to as as a player, I started to get dissatisfied. So I started to sort of think, well, I could run a bad game. <laughs> um, and again, like the 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 the, the lie was that oh, it will be the rules that will change that. But the problem, you see, I perceive the problem being like these heavier, crunchier rule sets. Um, yeah. But actually, the the lie that's a lie that wasn't true. They they probably contributed, but um, but actually, what was wrong was what we were doing wrong was methodologically, we were like allowing, well, we were forcing ourselves to do more switching. I mean, it just right. didn't feel as fun to me. Although, you know, the guys, I know that the guys who were playing, they were really loving the rulesy stuff because they were, that was what they came to the table for. They wanted to do, really, they wanted to play a skirmish game with one to one man to man gaming, you know, which is yeah. fine. Um, and they didn't... may never have interacted with play as an experience. Like it may never have occurred to them mm. in the same way that it would to me or to you. Mm. Um, for example, and I, I find it interesting how, like, when there was just one game, whatever that that first game is, we're not any good at it because we're beginners and we're teaching mm. ourselves. So learning is, we're learning how to learn it if we yep. bother to learn, rather than yeah. just play. You know. Yeah. yeah. So all of that's going on, and by the time we have any sense of our play we have a certain amount of rules mastery. We have a certain understanding of what role-playing games are. We have a certain understanding of, of uh, what we want out of them, but the pain of the learning process, the effort of the learning process pre-exists or, you know, takes place before we develop that sensitivity to, Mm -hmm. to play. But our second game or third game, now we've got the burden of knowing how good it can be 
because the game is new, it's not going to be that good. <laughs> so the, the effort of learning it gets incrementally harder. Yeah, and of course, you've got to keep straight. So when you're in real frame, you've got to keep straight all the different games you know. <laughs> um, and and even all the different editions of the games, you know. I mean, oh yes. my goodness! And and so you, well, at least what happened to me with that one is I, you know, like if we Dungeons and Dragons, for example, I got into third edition D and D in two thousand. I kind of like in a big way. I really enjoyed that particular edition of D and D. Um, I was playing with players who were really tactical game, uh, tactical battle mat gamers. So. And I was GMing, and I was quite happy to GM like was essentially a series of like mini skirmish battles for them, and we'd get really into the rules. And then when the fourth edition came out, and we we played that, and um, same style, but we got bored because there were fewer tactical options in fourth edition. Um, uh, really, uh, I genuinely think it's a less rich game, and that, that, that's an opinion. <laughs> um, but then then fifth edition came along, and and at that point. Um, I had started to really become cheesed off with running, you know, dungeony fighty tactical wargaming games. And um so I started to look at it. But you know, the problem I've got now is that I've got I've got uh BX and Beck Me and first edition and second edition and third edition and fourth edition and fifth edition in my head. And right. so when it's falling rules what are they then which one <laughs> so i have to kind of go and look them up my point with this is i kind of have to go and look them up to be sure and now and i sort of feel like i had this thing where i feel like i have to know the rules um and because i'm especially if i'm the gm because everyone has again the regular kind of game the gm is expected to know the rules yeah i'm always curious as to curious about that and I got to, I rebelled. I started, I actually got to a stage where I was like, I one of the angry, back to 2018, the angry me at that point was like, why do I have to know all the rules? You guys are using them at the table. Why can't you learn the flipping rules? <laughs> and I can focus on like the, the adventure and the, like uh, what's emerging from it and kind of giving you challenges. And you tell me what the falling rules are because you guys have got brains too. And, and it was just frustrating because I didn't really want to learn them because it wasn't right. interesting actually really terribly interesting um and keeping it all straight was just stressful so um i think like you know that that pushed me to the edge of i'm going to give this up this is and i, and I think that's what happened to a lot of players actually when I, you know coming back to my original so. thing of like why do people bail out of the hobby i think it just becomes sort of frustrating if you're not getting the experience you want and and then it's all complicated and you're like people are putting pressure on you to know it all and get it right and be just so and it's got to be rules as written and you know i'm putting funny faces i do this um <laughs> it's just a burden this whole thing is supposed to be fun like yeah. well no fun's a, a really cheap word um it's actually enjoyable and right because some horror play. games are not fun but they're enjoyable yeah yeah, yeah. well play is 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 sort of to some degree improvised and it really benefits from not being rigid <laughs> and it, it really benefits <laughs> from not having any particular i mean play uh i'm, I'm counting stuart brown here he's a, a kind of acknowledged expert and psychologist on the subject of play you know it is um it is purp apparently purposeless it has it has this improvisational sort of element to it. It's something that you do for its own sake, and it makes you want right. to do it again. It's something that has a timelessness to it and invokes flow, the flow state, which many people are familiar with. This idea of being unaware mm. of time moving by and, and unself conscious as well. All of those things. That's what play is. Is you know that's that's right. that when I mean, it's great play, all those things are true. And for me, it was work. <laughs> You know, running this game is work. Right. You Especially because you're not getting back the experience that mm. you want, either as a game mm. master providing experience or as a yeah. player having one. So mm. that's an awful lot of negative feedback. Mm. Just still tell yourself in the morning, wow, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't like it wasn't it wasn't terrible. It's just that all the time in the back of my mind i think was this memory of like being in character in the moment and in a state of flow 
actually to use the the sort of language but yeah. to be in that in role and just losing track of the hours and being told off by parents because we've overrun and time to go home now <laughs> um i i i have been at tables you know i've been running a game or even as a player especially as a player actually i think especially as a player at a table just so aware of the seconds ticking by like the idea that play is this sort of timelessness happens where you lose track of it and you're in a state of flow. I mean, the tedium of playing fourth edition D and D or fifth edition D and D in like the two or three years before I sort of just t- totally stopped playing those. Um, when I have I had a wizard character and it was like my go in the table. So when my time comes around basically i declare my action i roll my d20 i fail and i wait another 20 minutes for my option to say what i'm going to do roll my dice and fail because my dice always let me down and wait another 20 minutes and oh you know and honestly i can remember like there's a used to be in the room i we used to play and there was a clock literally a ticking clock and i Mm. the amount of times i just found myself more interested in the clock tick out tick tick yeah because a reason to be angry there well because i was waiting for people to make a decision about what their character is going to do and it was all it was all mechanistic it was all rules and i was really actually quite bored um but the character i created had this you know it was like something i would imagine would be a really fun character to play and i just didn't get to play that character um and in fact i found the rules got in the way of me playing my character um and and in I didn't realize you, why you got to use yeah, I, the character. Yeah, yeah, and, and I didn't understand why at the time. But now I, you know, the, the reality is I I wanted to make believe the character, and and, yeah. and my friends wanted to play the game rules. Right, right. So and, this, and it's not the same disconnection. Yeah. 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 So you know, I don't know. I, no, I hear you. I sound I sound really whingy now. I think. But... <laughs> no, I I mean. I think for people who aren't prepared or aren't aren't able to to hear the expression of the preference and how the preference isn't being satisfied, then it's going to get it can get categorized as as a complaint, right? Mm. Because they were satisfied, so now you're impacting their satisfaction by being unsatisfied. Mm. Um, but if we're a group, then I think that carries with it an obligation that that we all have some opportunity to be satisfied by the by the group's activity hmm. until we can talk to each other about what we what we want then it's random if we get it or not and we're all getting too old for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, but, and it uh, is super important to hear you play i mean I, i'm currently running a game um and i'm not actually i'm Am I enjoying? I'm enjoying like some of the prep stuff that I'm doing for the game, which is unusual for me, um, because it's it's a sort of rich world that I'm I'm able to sort of explore and, and bring to life and things. Yeah. But a couple of players have asked if like they, they didn't want to they didn't want to kind of play in the extreme sort of form of of kind of an immersive character driven play. They wanted to have a sheet in front of them and roll dice for themselves and, and sure. sort of look up stuff and engage with the rules in that way. So having heard that, you know, that's absolutely fine. We can do that. That's great. Um, and it's a compromise that happens, I suppose that, uh, but in the, in the healthy sense, I think of, yeah, yeah. So you're looking for a particular experience and to help you like enjoy what you feel is a game you need to see the game more. Um, sure. I don't. I don't need to see the mechanisms at all. So I'm quite happy. Like, I don't need to see... The, the analogy, I think John Ford uses is wonderful analogy of seeing the Matrix. I don't yeah. need to see the Matrix. I want to see the illusion. Right. Um, but, you know, some people want to see... They want to see the 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 woman in the red dress kind of <laughs> moment, you know. Um, One of the things that's, that struck me is... I, I think I've heard you say that you played palladium fantasy yes yes so one of the things we discovered with the way that its rules work is that combat is basically opposed roles yeah and we found in play very often that we were standing up 
to roll the dice and yeah. you know muscles twitching and and yeah. that that die roll became the sword strike or the axe blow yeah. or the shield parry yeah. and yeah. it was an analog for physical action in a in a very yeah. real sense so yeah. somehow that rules layer became like necessary fuel for mm -hmm. our in-character experience yeah and then like much later games like Shadowrun and and the world of darkness gave us so much data <laughs> yeah. you know so so much minutia about the things but sometimes with some groups of players there were those same moments where all of those modifiers gave me the in-character experience even though there was a lot of you know, mental load of, of processing yeah. the rules somehow i could get yeah. through the rules and into my imagination yeah um, whereas other games where you're asking me to negotiate about something or uh, spend a point for this or be willing to edit something or you know work on a story layer i've never mm -hmm. figured out how to get to my experience of the character through that it's like there's a an actual yeah. legitimate gulf at, at that stage between being able because of the environment to experience the character and only being able to experience the story yeah. side of things I, the description of things and i, I think say, there are, can, yeah, can i say an unpopular thing about that Sure. I know oh, we are slated for saying this, but I, I don't believe... So, like, games that have that story mechanistic kind of, you know, that that those tools that allow the player and the GM to sort of negotiate the outcome of the story and all those things, to my mind, they don't have a character layer. They are, they are purely... Uh, there's a rules layer and a player layer going on, and there's an interaction between them. And therefore, for me, if Gary Allen Fine's theory is correct that you need all three to have a role-playing game, they're not a role-playing game. They are a narrative story game, and there's nothing wrong with narrative story gaming, but it's not the same as role-playing. My experience of playing those games, I haven't played a lot of them, to be fair, but because I just don't enjoy them, but the, the reality is that I just can't be in character like you sort of alluded to. And I think this because the, the character frame is missing. And I also noticed with a lot of those games that the world itself isn't very important. It's, it's usually referred to as setting, um, as is a lot with story focused role players as well that talk about setting as if, like in the sense of theater the drop the backdrop it's not important right. really to what's happening in the story um and the, the characters are they're not inhabited they are manipulated that, and right. i don't mean that in a negative sense i just mean literally in that sense yeah, it's hard it's, hard, move them it's around. hard to describe without yeah, yeah. sounding yeah. negative yeah, but we move them around the scene like puppets in the theater kind of thing. And, um, mm -hmm. and I, but I don't really get to be them when I play those kind of games. So, because I'm constantly having to either make a decision that's rules based around like spending a point to edit the scene da -da -da -da, or describing what's going on, but it's usually quite detached. You know, yeah. it's this thing of this is what my, they do. And, you know, and I might act it, but I'm still. Because you can you could do that to some degree, but it's not really like I'm not in the character's frame. I'm not through the eyes. So that's that's one comment I wanted to make. The other one I want to make about the dice on Palladium, because earlier I said like take the dice out of my hands. I'm quite happy with that. But there is one exception that I've discovered, and that's I like. So I've loved Palladium, and I love um, also like Mithras from the, yeah. the BRP kind of line. But my my game I'm learning, that I'm learning to master is GURPS, which also has a per, opposed combat roles, you know, attack mm. role and defense role. And I think that it's, this is related to an element of immersion where, in a fight, I so again like a, in contrast to those sort of story games that might abstract the combat to a single sort of decision point in a single role. I actually want the other extreme. I want like every, I describe, I'm swinging my blade towards your shoulder, and right. and you know, going to like I want the sense of what my friend Arlen Walker calls bone crunch. Uh, I want the <laughs> right. sense that like as that strike goes in, that we can viscerally somehow sense that that the injury has been done and bones have been crunched and blood veins have been rent. Um, and one way that I have discovered that that can happen is if 
we are engaged in the description and in character and then if we you can use the dice as a proxy for the strike like you said like the yeah. sword itself and it's something physical about chucking the dice that you know that i did it um i think you could probably get the same if you were like larping and you actually hit someone i've done this as well in the past deep deep people as a kid larping with the sword and hit someone with my foamy sword you know right. um and and I'd have that same sense of being there and inhabiting that character. And so again, coming back to methodology, well, if you like Bone Crunch, and I do, then methodologically, that's the time when I roll my dice. Right. But I don't necessarily have to roll all my dice. So when if I'm like searching the room, I certainly would like you to roll that secretly because it's I yeah. don't want to know exactly. how yes. close or bad it was. But also like if I'm interacting. Like, I don't need to roll the dice to get the sense of talking to someone. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so you could roll my interaction rolls for me. I'm quite happy. The exception yeah. is fighting because there's something so right. visceral and, and 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 full on that maybe, just maybe, that that is the time when I could roll dice. But I still don't want to have a big discussion about the modifiers and everything. Um, you know, I'm quite happy yeah. for, for you to tell me that I've hit or missed based on my roll. And 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 to be honest, you know, like we've got so the non modifiers aren't all that complicated, um, you know. So again, we're talking about switching costs during a fight scene. It may well be that I'm willing to take a bit of a, a, a come out of character a little bit and 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 roll the dice and deal with that a little bit to lighten everyone's right. load, um, right. because I know that mechanically that that's important that life and death going on there um but you know again these are conscious decisions that we can make about how we play you know like how the assumption is like you know every player will usually players roll all of their dice do they do they have to do, you know um right, that's the just a question. assumption yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I just kind of think like what i would suggest is like when you're playing is noticing how it feels when you do those things like when i roll the dice and i look stuff on my sheet do i enjoy that if i enjoy doing that then there's nothing wrong with that if that's the experience i'm enjoying from play but if it, it if it yeah. jars and sort of i feel like it's an interruption to what i was i was imagining and now you know or i was just enjoying everyone's dialogue around the table and now what you want me to roll something if that's jarring um then ask yourself well why why do we do that uh, would it be exactly. okay for the the GM who's not actually engaged in character necessarily? Would it be okay for them to roll it, or would it be okay for a completely different player to roll it in that moment? Because again, who says it had to be the GM who does all the dice rolling? Could it be that if there's four players around the table, that yeah. if I'm involved in a scene and you're not involved in a scene directly, or at least not right now, that you could roll the dice quickly, you know? And that's interesting. It. Right? Yeah, uh, but but these are choices. That's all I'm saying. So one one thing I find interesting, I know we we really do have to probably wrap things up because who's going to listen for more than an hour? But uh, the never barrier, heard of pause. I, <laughs> the bar the barrier I feel <laughs> um, for the in character experience, the more we add on the ability to manipulate the environment of play, let's yep. say, the more engagement. I'm not going to say immersion really, but the more engagement I get as a game master. Yeah. So there are loads of games that I love playing as a game master that I have zero interest in playing as a player. Okay. And uh, we don't have to name names about these games, but the, yeah. the greater ability that there is to interact with things on the story layer, on the narrative layer, however you want to describe it, the more opportunities I'm finding I have as the game master to to visualize things and to feel more of the reality of the game world. I still have a breaking point with negotiation about things. Hmm. Like, can I spend this point to undo the last 10 minutes or, you know, whatever. Uh, that I mean, that completely stops the game for me and turns into something else um, mm -hmm. or it I think more accurately butts up so strongly against my preferences that I'm I'm unwilling to take that in as as part of the game. You know? Yeah, I, I personally find it hard to unremember uh, the scene. So, like, if 
so the way again is the way experience works but obviously when we're imagining our brain has a hard diff time telling the difference between like the imaginary thing and the real and the real if, there, yeah. if there's a such a thing of the real world and universe I, i'm increasingly doubtful of the fact that there is a sort of objectivity to the universe at all but um let's put aside that philosophy um <laughs> the the point being that like the brain finds it hard so if i i mean i see this as an as a person who's who's struggled with anxiety like the imagined story that i'm telling myself about the catastrophe that might happen is very real to me in the moment when i am imagining it and it's wearing in my head and i'm i'm just doing my head hand here about how my head is spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning um and of course it's someone says to you yeah well that might not happen or that in fact that's very unlikely to happen uh, that isn't very helpful if you're in the mode, of, if you're an anxious person and is struggling with a catastrophizing moment. Um, and even if you then come to your senses and you realize that actually I'm not actually in danger right now, and this actually isn't happening right now, I've just sort of imagined some future, it's still very hard that the emotions take time to drain away. And of course, you have the memory of that catastrophe that never happened, but which you've invented. And right. I think like this is the same with gaming for me. Like uh, if I'm if something's happening in the game and the, the emergent of the emergent sort of narrative of the game is going on and on, someone was to say to me, "Oh, can we just take back the last ten minutes?" It's like I, I find it really hard. I can't forget the last ten minutes. You know, like uh, it would be a conscious effort to then disregard that, and that feels like a, a violation of like the contract we started out with, which is that we would play to find out what happened. And to go then, we planned and found out what happened and we didn't like it, so we're going to take it back uh, is really difficult for me, you know? Um, mm. We didn't like what happened, so we're going to play a game to find out what happens and it better be different. Uh, it yeah. sort of feels weird to me. Um, now, of course, you know, that's, that's just me. That's my preferences. Right, because um, we're going to meet people who mm. thrill, who like get, they just light up on all levels at mm. being able to interact with the play environment that way yeah yeah, yeah. and uh yeah, it's, it's just fascinating. That, yeah just i mean that's great and it's like sometimes it's just enough to be honest enough with ourselves to say you know i i don't think i'm going to fit in with this group of people you know or i right. i'm not you know I, I don't i don't think i'm the gm for you or i don't think i'm a player for your group i've plenty of times and, and I, I, I suppose like at times in my life when i've been particularly sensitive and anxious and things you're like you take that very personally, you know, like the, this idea that I'm not really going to fit in. I don't want to not fit in. I like to be liked and I like to fit in, you know, but in the end, if I'm just going to be miserable <laughs> um, or if I'm going to sit there and the worst of me is when I'm not jamming and I'm just sitting there grinding my teeth about like how things are being run. Um, mm. And because it's because the gym's not provided me with what i was wanting and if i didn't have the courage to say well actually i want this please please don't give me a character sheet don't make me don't refer to numbers ever and don't make me roll dice apart from in fights um and most gyms gym, would probably look at you and go what you know like huh yeah. but you know actually that's that's what i would like i'd love to play in your D, &D game actually i you know i was earlier i was I was being a little negative about that, but I would love to play in your D and D fifth edition game if I don't have to look at a carrot sheet, I don't have to talk about numbers, and I don't have to roll dice. Um, and it's quick. Uh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. really getting around, to, you know, like getting people to be disciplined enough to make a decision quickly um, is is you know that that and that's it really. I, I'd be quite happy, um, but of course, a lot of James would just go, "Well, that's not playing it right." Because right. or I don't one know how method. to run it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one method is that everyone has the you know the assumption assume method is everyone has their character sheet in front of them. Everybody has their own dice and they roll their own dice. You know, these are all the, like the the regular way of playing. That's the most common way in which is played. That's the sort of what's what sort of emerged, I suppose, is the most the most likely way that people will play if you sit down with random group players. Right. Um, but as we I'm asked, to yeah, I just, I just increasingly asking myself, well, why do we do that? Do we have to do that? Is that actually helping? And if it <laughs> is, great. And if it isn't, well, what could we do different then? Um, I think those are the questions, the killer questions. Yeah. So, 
yeah, old curmudgeon that I am. Um, and thank you if you've made it through this far in this episode. Then thank you. Um, and I think course, people who I listen sound... to this channel are used to curmudgeons. <laughs> and, and all I would say is that if like um, if like us, because it seems like you and I have this in common that we really would like this uh, sense of character and world immersion. Um, mm. If you like that, then please tell somebody, uh, preferably us, because we would <laughs> recruit you. I would recruit you into a group. Um, so you know, with the role play rescue, you know there are players who, uh, you know, like I game with regularly, and um, there aren't enough of them who want what I want. So um, you know, I guess I will happily betray them and kick them out, and you can come play. No, I'm being a bit mean. <laughs> yeah, add them, add them to the stew. But no, well, what I would say is, you know, tell us that's what you want because um, you'd probably be surprised. I've been surprised at how many people have gone. You yeah, actually kind of fancy that. Um, yes. And uh, a few people have tried it, and not everybody, but more people than I thought have gone. This is really fun. So um, I'll just leave that as a sort of you know, tell someone if if it's if you think you fancy less time fiddling with the rules and more time fiddling with your character and role, but at the same time you can play with like crunchier rules because the assumption is that the only way to do this is to play with very few rules um, right it that's not true the case. Yeah. it's not true it's a lie it's a lie awesome <laughs> well i want to thank you for thank coming you. on oh, um, thanks for having me one of the things that i frequently run into trouble with is cultures of play clashing you know mm. i i want to try and talk about something like what fine calls frames, what I call layers, mm. what someone else yep. would call something else. And the terminology gets in the way yep. or the, 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 the thought hasn't been explored well enough by one or more parties. And so we can't, we don't even know what we want to say. So we don't know how to listen to what the other person is saying. But I felt that in this conversation, even though we're using in our own heads, different terminology, I think we could, we could feel the connection between the the ideas behind the reason why the terms were chosen. Yeah, I certainly feel that way. I think, um, is it Peterson? Uh, he talks about like just there. There are different ways of communicating. I think what we've been doing is having one of those they're genuinely explorative you know conversations where both of us have experienced things and we're trying to explore those experiences and then discover together something new about those and i've certainly mm. a few things that i've really you know you've helped me understand for example I've reminded me actually about combat and dice and things um which is something that's very true that actually yeah i've i've experienced that too and it's easy to forget um but what, my point in kind of raising this is is that if we can have these kind of dialogues where we're both going in with an open an openness to learn like as peterson's comment is like assume that the person you're talking to knows something you don't um <laughs> and, I, and i just think that's really it's hard because it requires a like to open up and listen and and risk changing your mind about something but um yeah, yeah i think that these sorts of dialogues is what i think i would encourage at the table um yes. it's actually i you know i'd actually suggest that when you form a new group don't try and do like social zero and talk about game just sit and talk to each other about your experiences. I think the best advice I've come across on setting up a game was from the angry GM, whose comment was just to get people talking about past game experiences as much as possible and then listen in on what it is that they're talking about enjoying because the things they met remember, they were what was meaningful and, right. and therefore probably what was enjoyable. And then if you can start seeing patterns there, then that'll help you to okay so we all seem to enjoy this sort of thing so what can we do with our play that will help us get that experience again and then we can have a conversation about method and and it might be that which rule set would help that method and which world would be fancy and and you put yeah. those three things together you've got a game that maybe everyone's going to enjoy but it might take you a few hours of and i mean hours of talking yeah. together um over time even to to figure that out and um like the conversation the richest part of tonight's conversation for me was talking about right back in the day what i enjoyed and the journey through to help yeah. me understand oh yeah that's really is what i did enjoy um and what led to the frustration anger in the middle 
Um, yeah. Uh, the good news is the story is resolving itself. Right. So awesome. I'm, I'm coming back to the beginning. Um, and I, I see myself as apprenticing myself back to being a player in a GM, which is, uh, yeah. you know, sort of, I, I have no illusions to having mastery over anything anymore. Uh, it's, you know, it's that full Arist- uh, no, Socrates, isn't it? The, the, you know, the, I, I know that I know nothing and, and I'm kind of calm with that. That is it. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Well, on, on that happy and wise note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you again for, for coming to join us. And uh, if you enjoyed what you heard so far, or at least think that you could in a more controlled and much shorter environment, check out Roleplay Rescue. I know you'll enjoy what you find. And uh, until the next time, take care. You've been listening to the Casting Shadows podcast, where, among other things, we continue our quest for the eighth or maybe ninth days of the week so that we can get some gaming done in amidst all the other obligations that we have. (laughs) I want to thank my guest, Jay Webster, for coming on and participating. I appreciate the time it took and the interest that he showed. I'm looking forward to our next conversation. I also want to thank Spencer Freethrall from Keep on the Borderlands for a fantastic article that he's written inspired by some of the stuff that we talked about today, either directly or tangentially. And you can find his writings on his new, I guess I'll call it a blog on the Stochasium, a Substack. So go to Keep Off the Borderlands and find a direct link and start reading. I think you'll enjoy it. I also want to thank the random screed, Jason Hobbs, for communicating with me and talking with me and providing me interesting listening from the car and being a part of this conversation too, both before it began and as it has continued. Finally, it's RPG a day, almost. August brings with it RPG A Day 2023, and this year is its 10th anniversary. So, if you want to participate, or if you'd like to be hopefully persuaded into participating, check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash runeslinger, and there you'll find a video that explains everything, or head over to my co-hosts and its and the event's founder's blog, autocratic.com and autocratic is spelled with a final K and you'll find everything you need to know there or if you're so inclined you can head over to my blog castingshadowsblog.com and likewise you'll find everything you need to know there so with just a few days really between us and the advent of August and RPG A Day 2023. Good friend of the show, Jason Connerly of the Nerds RPG Variety Cast, has prepared one of his amazing contests. And I invite you to go over to his podcast and listen to his contest episode to see how you can participate and maybe win an awesome prize and just be cool. (laughs) All of the links to all of the things that I consider important in this outro, you'll be able to find in the show notes. Anyway, enough. This episode is over. So, until the next time, take care.